Thanks for everyone for, uh, for joining me in this discussion. Um, today I want to talk about Git, uh, commit messages, and some uh, unexpected value that they can provide as uh, a form of documentation. So starting out, I, uh, I want to talk about complexity. Uh, I started at Stitch Fix a little bit over a year ago, and uh, we have pretty good onboard documentation. I read the wiki, I read the, uh, you know, your first day, got my computer set up, um, and I felt like I had a pretty good sense of the teams and the apps. Um, but then the rubber met the road, and I got my first story. Uh, and this is, and I, my team works on an application that's been around for about five, you know, probably about six years now. Um, and so it's accrued a lot of complexity. Uh, and so, and not, add, add to this, the first story I took was a, a bug fix. Um, and so as I got into it, um, this is just what it felt like. Uh, it felt like I was dealing with uh, a lot of different pieces and they're connected to each other, but it wasn't exactly clear why uh, or how they're connected uh, or, you know, when I'm changing something here, what's going to happen elsewhere. Um, and so it got me thinking about documentation um, and where I could look for the answers to this question. Uh, and two, two different metrics stand out for me as a way of thinking about my documentation. Um, accuracy and accessibility. So accessibility to me means uh, that I don't have to work too hard to get it. Um, if I have to look at documentation often throughout a day, I don't, if, you know, if it takes me a minute to find an answer, uh, and I'm doing that a couple dozen times, that's, you know, that's 30 minutes. It really adds up. And so if I can get an answer quickly, you know, in a few seconds, that's perfect. If I don't even have to leave my text editor, that's even better. Accuracy is kind of like what it sounds like. It's a sense of, uh, you know, is the information I'm reading, is it correct? Or, you know, has something changed? Has the code evolved in a way that is separate from the documentation, and now what I'm reading about it is incorrect? So one of the ways we can get answers is with, my phone will connect, all right, we're gonna do it this way. It's with wikis. Uh, so this is how I started, and we're gonna get all the transitions now. Um, so uh, wikis are great for the onboarding stuff, the new hire, the like high level, you're not going to change it very often. Um, but, you know, I can see I put it down here in the bottom left because they're not super accessible. Yes, you can search some, but for me, in my experience, the search just never seems to work as like I want. I always have a hard time. Um, and they're not uh, always accurate. So, uh, you know, for new hire stuff, they're good, but if you were to try to document that circuit diagram, that entire system in a wiki, it would just very quickly go out of date. Um, next is JIRA. So issue trackers, maybe use Pivotal Tracker. Um, we use JIRA at Stitch Fix, and I can look at recent issues and try to get a sense of what's been changing um, and follow that, but it's, I would say, even less accessible than a wiki. There, it's very challenging to search, um, but maybe a little bit more accurate because it's, it's a little bit more timely. Um, GitHub, GitHub's up there because it searches a little bit better than wikis, and it has the same accuracy as, you know, a little bit more accurate than JIRA because it's uh, still timely. I can look at the issues, I can look at pull requests. If we really want to nail accessibility, comments, the comments have a bad rap, uh, understandably, and that's why I've put it pretty low on the accuracy. It's super accessible, which is probably, probably the reason we often turn to comments as a way of documenting things. Um, because it's right there in the code, and it checks that box of, I don't even have to leave the text editor. However, as we've probably, as a lot of us have may, may have experienced, they're not always accurate. Um, it's easy to change the method, change what's happening, and forget to update the documentation. And so, we're here to talk about Git. Git is, what I think, the, the best of both of these. Uh, I'm gonna show in a few minutes some different ways that it's hyper accessible through text editor integrations, uh, and it's very accurate. As you are modifying the code, you're gonna write a new message that describes the change, and because that change, that message is attached to the code that it's changing, if you, you know, overwrite a method, you're now gonna have the new message. You are automatically updating the, the documentation associated with that.
Here's an example. Um, it's a code I was looking at in this application, and uh, something about this caught my eye. It, it's that comment. So if we go, if we have 99999, uh, and we want to generate the next one. This is for generating purchase order numbers. Uh, we wrap back to one. And my first instinct is, uh, you know, are we going to start overriding PO numbers? Like, what's going to happen? Um, why, you know, what is going on here? Why? Why is this the behavior that you want? Um, I can look at the code itself and see the how, um, but I couldn't see the why. Um, and so I followed my instincts. I looked at the git blame, and this was the message I saw. Work in progress, generate PO numbers based off of starting point. Now, to be fair, this commit was written uh, four years ago. Uh, so it was a different time for the company. We were moving fast, um, and so, but it's not unsurprising to see these kinds of commits uh, in our repositories. More recently, <laughs> I did this. This is some work that I'm doing. Uh, I'm actually still working on this. Uh, there's one of our pages where we wanted to change the, the CSS to a new framework. And it's not you know, really prioritized in our sprints. It's something that I tend to just hack on every, you know, whenever I have 30 minutes, whenever I can just take a few minutes to update a new little part. And so it's resulted in a lot of work in progress commits. The changes aren't often atomic, and so I don't, you know, have time or much, there's not anything to unite to commit that I would give it a good message, and so it just has developed into this work in progress mess. And I want my commits to be uh, valuable to my coworkers. I want them to provide context. And what I just showed you clearly isn't gonna do that. If somebody get blames, they're not gonna understand any of the issues that I ran into updating the CSS or why I may have change the button color, um, I have sacrificed that documentation with, with, this, uh, with this bad uh, history. So let's talk real quick about how we can use the history. The simplest is to git log. If you just run it in your terminal, um, you're gonna get a very verbose output. Um, and so it's maybe not the most useful on its own, but if you pair this with some of the command line options, you can search through your Git history. Uh, and if you're using a GUI, which you, you know is perfectly legit, then you can um, you can also search through GUIs. So there's a lot of richness just in the Git log command. But my favorite way, and the way I more often use it, is with Git blame. Um, so here's an example of a Git blame integration with VS Code. You can probably barely see it, but off to the right of each line that I've highlighted, there's a little annotation that shows the commit's author, and uh, I think it's also the, uh, how long ago? How long ago that, that was changed? And if you hover over it, you get this nice little pop-up, gives you a little bit more information, includes a link to take you right to GitHub if you, uh, if you wanna view it there, if you wanna share it with someone. It's a pretty great integration with uh, VS Code. Uh, and then here's, Another example, this is Atoms. Atoms I like because it has this heap, this uh, little heat map bar, and so uh, the more orange that line is, the more recent it is, and bluer is older. That's nice if you're just getting into a file and you wanna see what's been happening in this code recently, uh, or if you're debugging and you wanna see maybe somebody made a change that had some unexpected consequences. This is a really cool integration. But all of this depends on writing good commit messages. So if we are, uh, you know, we can see how, it's not helpful enough to just know that a commit's recent or old, but we also need to include all this information. So let's take a few minutes to think about what, um, what makes these commit messages valuable. The first thing is starting off with a good title. Um, so I like this convention. Um, this is, I think, pretty liberally borrowed from Tim Pope's, one of Tim Pope's blog posts. Um, I like this convention of starting with a capitalized verb. Uh, we'll go through some examples, but for example, uh, one example is uh, add a blog post, or add, add posts, uh, or update CSS. Uh, and follow that with a description. This is where I think a lot of times we, we move a little too fast. 
This is a wonderful place to take a second and just think about yourself in a week or a month or a year. What questions are you gonna ask? If you were to look at this code again, and you, what is gonna make you raise an eyebrow? What do you think somebody else is gonna wonder? Uh, what do you, what do you wanna make sure people aren't tapping you on the shoulder or writing you in Slack? Like, you wanna try to answer these questions for them if you can. Uh, and it's not just, um, you know, I, I personally, I don't know if this is selfish or, or lazy or what, but I, I really like to think about myself about this. Uh, it, for some reason it just really helps motivate putting the right content in here. Um, and so yeah, it's, it's, it's good to focus on your descriptions. Uh, and then last is an issue tracker. For the most part, uh, you, you will be using an issue tracker. Um, maybe it's GitHub issues. Maybe it's JIRA, Pivotal Tracker. And if you include a reference to your issue tracker in the commit message, this gives people a way to find that original issue and, um, and again, just kind of connect it to the business context, connect it to the bigger picture. So here's an example of a commit I was working on. Uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna, for this, all these examples, we're gonna say I'm working on a blog. Uh, so this is my commit message. And let's try to apply those guidelines we just talked about. Um, so if I start off with out, add posts, well, first thing we can see is that we need to work on that title. Um, so let's capitalize the, uh, the first letter. Uh, and you know, this, is, this seems like a really minor, like pedantic thing, but it adds a lot of like, uh, like visual cohesion or like professionalism. It adds like that nice touch to your Git history and it's, almost evocative of like a broken windows principle that like if you just show that you like or take that level of care, that it somehow motivates others and, and like says like we care about this. Um, so here's just a, a, a slightly more descriptive title. I'm not doing too much in this commit, I'm just generating a post model and a table. Um, but there are some details I can add. So uh, I can write a small sentence about it. Uh, maybe I'm not adding too much detail, but I, I am de I'm highlighting that the, uh, the posts have a title and body. Um, I, I'm also calling out that uh, maybe uh, somebody looking at this in the future would wonder why I, I didn't associate posts with a user. Um, surely that's something you'd have to have. Well, I can highlight that that's coming in a future, future story, and so don't worry. Uh, and then, of course, we have to add our issue tracker. So, we still have this mess though. I've written all these bad commits. What am I gonna do about this? Um, let's talk about some tools that we can use to uh, help work with our Git history. First is rebasing. Um, this one has developed quite a reputation uh, and I, I feel like I've run into a lot of junior engineers who were uh, told at one point to just never rebase, just don't worry about it, it's going to ruin the history and you're gonna like, destroy my work, so just, just don't ever do it. Um, and that's what I was told when I started out. Um, but then I, you know, I started uh, talking to other engineers, reading some blog posts, uh, and there's a tutorial I, I'll share in a minute that was also really helpful. Um, and once I got my head around what's happening, it really, uh, really empowered my Git workflow. And so I'm gonna go through a really this is the simplest rebasing example I could think of. Um, but I hope it helps give you some visual model of what's happening. Um, so in this example, uh, we are on the master branch. I just, I'm only showing two commits. And head is a reference, it's just saying which branch am I currently on. So if I were to run git status right now, you'll can, you can see confirmation I'm, I'm on master. So as, as we're going along, you'll see that head reference move around. All right, so let's start our new feature. This is gonna be a feature where I'm adding a post model. So I'm gonna check out with the dash B flag to create a new branch. And you can see it's added the new branch and that head reference has now moved up because I'm now on add posts. I've done some work. We're gonna give it a not so great commit message, but we're gonna, just for this example, make a quick commit 
and I'm gonna switch back to master. This is, uh, let's say I, I'm working on this with uh, my buddy, and I know that they just made some, uh, they just merged a pull request into master, and I, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm working on the most recent version of master. So I need to switch back to master, and then I run git pull, which is gonna get that new work, and fast, it's gonna move master along. So you see there's now this divergence in the history. Um, and this is where rebasing becomes valuable. I can switch back to add posts, and I can run git rebase master. When I do this, git is gonna take the commit, this commit, in this case we only have one commit, it's gonna take this commit, and it's gonna change the base of it from that original commit, 320, and it's gonna change the base to master. So it's gonna replay that work onto master, And when it does that, it's gonna generate a new shawl. This is something just to keep in mind, we're gonna come back to the consequences of this. So this is where it can kind of create headaches for people. So that's the simplest example of rebasing I could think of. Um, so let's make it a little bit more complicated. Uh, in this example, I've done three commits worth of work, and let's say we still have some work in progress in there, and I, and I don't really want that to live forever. Um, so let's this time do an interactive rebase. This is by and far the most powerful way to do a rebase. Although it's gonna pop up this giant wall of text. But don't be worried, most of this is just documentation. Um, so everything on the bottom that starts with a hash is just documenting what you can do with an interactive rebase. And everything at the top are your commits. So these are those three commits that um, are within this rebase, and it's gonna apply them from top to bottom, and what it's gonna do is, so on the far left where it says pick, that's the instruction, so it's telling Git, uh, you should just pick this commit, and if we were to close the editor right now, it would work as if we hadn't done an interactive rebase anyways. Uh, but there are a lot of other options we can use, and these are the ones that uh, I end up using the most. Uh, I, I know this text is small, so I hope people in the back can still read it, um, so pick is the one that we're already on, it's the default. That's just gonna use the commit, use the message and everything just moves on. Reword is gonna use the commit and give you a chance to change the message. So if you, this one I, I end up using a lot because I will often get carried away working and forget to add the issue tracker to my store, to my commit messages. And so I'll do an, uh, an interactive rebase and I'll reword the commits which gives me a chance to add that issue tracker back in. Squash is going to take the commit and combine it with the previous one. Uh, and fix up is just like that, but it's going to um, discard the message. So with squash, you're gonna have a chance to edit the message, fix up, it's just gonna get rid of the message. So in this example, let's say we wanna pick that first, we wanna pick that first commit, and then the next two commits, we wanna combine into the first commit. So we're gonna change the next two lines to squash. Uh, when we close the editor, Git's going to, again, pick up those commits, and it's going to open up another editor. Uh, so this is, because we did squash, it's going to give you a chance to update the commit message. So this is the original commit message, um, but we just did some work on creating a new commit message, so let's get rid of that, and then let's add in our new commit message that's descriptive, has a good title, and has a link to our issue tracker. Now, when we close the editor, Git's gonna do its thing, it's gonna, commit, it's gonna combine these commits, and it's gonna replay it onto master, and once again, give it a new shawl. So these are two very, you know, these are probably some of the simpler cases of uh, rebasing. Um, if, I, I wish I could spend more time going through examples. I love rebasing. Um, this is a great resource, uh, Learn Git Branching. If you aren't familiar with it, I highly recommend you check it out. Check it out. It goes, it starts from a very simple, uh, I think it starts with just like creating a commit, and then takes you all the way up to like really intense rebasing and like combining different crazy branches that I hope you never end up in that situation. Um, but it's, it's super good practice. Uh, and, and by the way, I will, um, I have at the end of this a link to everything that I'm referencing. Um, 
and I'll publish my slides online, so th these will be available. Okay, so we've covered rebasing. Um, so let's talk about amending commits. This happens to me way too often. Um, I think I'm done, and then I realize, ah, oh, yeah, I gotta run the test suite. Uh, and I run it, and I get a failure. Um, so one option is I can fix it, I can add those changes, and create a new commit that's just fixing the test. And, and I, you know, this is, you see this all the time, or I do. Um, this is fine, um, if we look at the log, the, the problem is we have this, we have two commits that are now, neither of them are atomic commits, uh, and this is a word you may have heard about commits. It's this idea that a commit is um, an isolated change, and it can exist like on its own. That right now there's a dependence that we couldn't release this without 8.9.f, but, uh, and so that means that that B9E commit is not atomic. Uh, the test suite was not green. So that's one of the downsides of this. Um, another is the it's not, uh, it doesn't help my coworkers get context on what's, what change is happening. So if my coworker goes and looks at uh, these tests that I had to fix, and they try to understand what was happening, and they want to understand why the test was written this way or what feature we were working on, um, they're gonna see fixed tests as their commit message. And that's not what the feature was. That was a consequence of the fact that I broke the test. Uh, the feature was I added posts. Um, and so it's not providing enough, it's not providing as much context as it could. But we have an option, and this is the amend flag with committing. So with dash dash amend, Git will open up the editor again and give us a chance to change the message. And so this is, this is more powerful than just adding in new work. It's also useful if you realize that you need to make a change to the commit message. Uh, but in this example, I'm just focusing on um, we've made some fixes and we need to combine them with the previous work. Uh, so here I can commend, I can amend it. Looks, you know, the message isn't gonna change, so that's fine. Uh, and when I exit, it's gonna um, just make another commit. It's gonna make this, it's gonna update that commit. And of course we can run our tests. See, they're all green, that's great. Now we can look at git log. We have a nice, clean history. It's descriptive, and it builds context for our, our coworkers, explains what we were doing. Um, so let's push it up. Ah, dang it. Ah, rejected. Ah, so <laughs> if, you've done any, if you've done any of this before, you've probably ran into this. Um, and this is where that detail about the Shaw changing comes in. There's a, um, and this is, also, I think why a lot of times junior engineers are told just to avoid rebasing, because there's a bit of a decision tree that emerges. Um, so this is roughly what happens in my head. It's, there's a lot of nuance to this, and so don't, you know, but yeah. Um, the, for me, we are using a pull request workflow at Stitch Fix. So each feature starts out as a new branch, and I own that branch. I'm the only one working on that branch. The powerful thing about that is because I'm the only one, only one working on that branch, I'm not at risk of and I'm not at risk of messing up someone else's work if I were to rebase and push or force push, which we'll show in a minute. Um, however, if you are not using that type of workflow. Uh, or if you are working on a feature branch with someone else, then you should not rebase, and you should not amend. Um, there's a lot of danger in, um, in how you could uh, potentially lose other people's work. Um, it's not, yeah, so um, let's now try that push again. This time we're gonna use a, a different, we're gonna use a flag. Um, there's actually two ways to accomplish this. This one is a slightly safer way. So, the simplest way is with just dash dash force. When you do that, Git is going to just tell GitHub, take this, I don't care what you have, I don't care if anyone's done anything on it, my version is the right one, take it. Force with least is a slightly gentler version of that. 
you're still telling Git, take this, I know that I'm changing the history from what you have, but it's instead saying, if someone else has changed the history since I last pushed, then reject me. And so this is a slightly safer way uh, if, you know, just in case one of your coworkers um, decides to unexpectedly contribute to your feature branch, this is a, a way to avoid that. Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, there's yet another way that I like to deal with messy Git history. Um, and it's probably the way that I'll end up dealing with this. The reason is, because of the nature of this work, um, I ended up with a lot of merge conflicts, and instead of trying to rebase my branch onto master, I ended up back merging master into my branch, which I didn't talk about, but is another way of keeping my branch up to date. Um, and so the git history for this is quite a mess. Um, but it doesn't mean that I have to let this make it onto the master branch. I can still, I still have one more chance to clean it up uh, before it makes it to master. And it's this option, if you click this little arrow when you go to merge a commit, there's this squash and merge option. What it does is it's doing that same, you know, rebase squash that we just went through, and it's giving you the chance here to edit the commit message. Um, so, here, you can see I've just taken, uh, I already had the uh, description written well, and so I just copied and pasted that. Uh, updated the commit message and merged it. And so now, even though I started off with a, you know, a mess of work in progress commits, what's made in, what it you know, eventually makes, and makes it into master, uh, I will be able to add more co context and color to so that it's helpful for my coworkers. So bringing it back, I just, um, yeah, I just wanna talk about accuracy and accessibility. Uh, and I've also added succinctness here because I, I find that um, it kind of speaks to how quickly you can find answers in Git uh, if you and your coworkers invest the time and effort into writing quality messages. Um, so thank you again for coming out and hearing my talk. I work at Stitch Fix. This is my Twitter handle. You can uh, try to reach out to me. I'm not a huge Twitter person, but I will try to pay attention. Um, so email is another option. Uh, and again, I'll put my slides up on um, the speaker deck, I think is the website. Uh, and so all of these links will be accessible. Um, so there's the Tim Pope article about uh, commit messages. Force with lease is an Atlassian article that's pretty good. And then um, that learn Git branching is a great tutorial. You can also just Google it and it's pretty easy to find. So thank you.